Hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to Cooking Up with Israel at Home, featuring our amazing uh, celebrity chef all the way from Tel Aviv, Mario Salomon. Uh, he's got some amazing things for, to cook up for us today. Uh, we're going to start nice and on time. It's just gone three o'clock. I'll let people in as they arrive. But it now gives me great pleasure to hand over to Lisa Peretz from the Marketing Department of the South African Federation to introduce Marius. Take it away, Lisa. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, on this uh, Sunday afternoon. And we're tuning in and we're joined with uh, Marius, who's tuning in from uh, Tel Aviv, a sweltering Tel Aviv, I hear. Boiling hot there. Marius. Marius, can we can you put your sound on? Marius, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, how are you doing, Marius? Hi. Nice to hear of all of you. Yes, oh, nice to be here with you. Humid. Thank you. So, very humid there. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited. Um, you're going to be cooking two amazing dishes today, right? We're looking at yes. uh, uh, the Mizrahi fish recipe, as well as a shawarma chicken and Israeli couscous. Yes. Okay, what are we starting off with today, Marius? Okay, we're going to start with the shawarma uh, titim, or the couscous, Israeli couscous. And uh, when we're going to finish, we're going to go to the fish. So we're going to have a little interval between the fish uh, nosach or what, the way that the Mizrahim are making. And we're going to be it's going to be made as an infusion that we're not going to have any arguments from this class or that. Later on, you will understand from the stories. Okay, I just wanted, can I just tell all the viewers uh, that please, as you have questions, post them in the chat, post them on Facebook, um, and we will ask uh, Marius the questions as during his, his cooking demonstration. So he'll be able to answer all those questions. Over to you, Marius. Hi. Just a little bit of introduction. I started uh, cooking up in Israel at home about uh, eight weeks ago, 10 weeks ago. And suddenly on the second class, I find myself on a plane going to Israel. So I'm happy to be here, but not why I wanted to continue. After two weeks of quarantine, when I connected, uh, contacted uh, Lisa, that we can do the program, you say, only going to be time on the 16th of August. I thought by that time I may be back in South Africa. Looks like it doesn't happen so quickly. So most probably after the Hagim. But in the meantime, I was looking for type of dishes that will suit the South Africans because of the winter time. And uh, one of the good recipes and very interesting that is more modern and infused I find the shawarma, but everybody knows shawarma. And shawarma titim, what is titim uh, in South Africa, they call Israeli couscous, a combination to keep you warm. The same way the second dish, the fish, the Mizrahi fish, oriental fish, that is made like crime and infused like the Moroccan. So a combination that a little bit hot and definitely will warm your belly during this winter time, even that I heard that South Africa is warming up a little bit. Compared to Israel, I wouldn't make this this year because it's so hot. If you're talking it's about 33 degrees outside in the shade and uh, very, very humid, 80, over 80% 80 humidity. But without further ado, let's go and talk what we're gonna do today. And we're gonna start with shawarma titim. And for those, we're going to show you the ingredients. So. Uh, if you want to move it to the ingredients, David, okay, we have the chicken shawarma that can be chicken breast cut in cubes or can be chicken thighs again cut evenly cubes because that's way it will cook much evenly and quicker. We're gonna have some roughly chopped onion. We're gonna have some parsley chopped. We're going to have spring onion, as more as better. We're going to have some uh, chopped uh, garlic. And we have the pitim. The pitim, as you can see, you can find them in kosher shops, in picking pants and other places like Rurot or Portuguese shops in South Africa. There are different names for it. 
but you can't just now, at the moment we are the ingredients. So we have the titim and then we have a mixture of spices. And this is what actually will make this portion or this type of dish very, very special. We're gonna have some salt, some turmeric, or what we call it curcum. We're gonna have some black pepper and cumin. We're gonna have a little chili, those who like to add a little bit chili, not necessary. And we have some secret ingredients to use, half a teaspoon or one teaspoon, depends on the quantity of bicarbonate soda. This is the ingredient that will keep you moist and soft, this dish. And we have about two or three spoons of oil. Let me tell you the story about the shawarma first, and then we go to the cooking. Shawarma is originated from the Turkmen tribes. They advanced from the Middle Asia towards the West and later on become the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire. And they conquer, conquered half of, the, half of Europe and North Africa and the Arab uh, lands. And the shawarma in Turkish called Chwe, Chweve, it's meaning a uh, rotisserie, a uh, turning. And later on, the Arab word uh, made it into shawarma. The chwermi it was a horizontal uh, rotisserie. It started in the beginning with the Turkmen riding the whole day, moving with the uh, herds. And at night, when they made the bonfire, they stick on the swords a piece of meat and they turn it on the fire. That happened also in the Middle East, I mean, in the Middle Europe or medieval times as well, uh, developed. Later on, during the Ottoman empires, the horizontal shawarma that is very popular today to make it, uh, become a vertical one. The horizontal one today is like a underneath fire and the shawarma is turning uh, horizontally that is sliced and the Turks are using a skewer and the skewer put to the meat and with the other sharp knife you cut slices. The whole idea of the shawarma turning around the source of heat can be to the electrical or gas and mainly is a vertical one because it's much easier to slice it, is to cut thin slivers and very quickly you can get to the things you don't have to burn the whole meat to wait for hours. Uh, the shawarma become popular very much in Egypt, but in Israel, who is considered today one of the most popular street foods and quick food, it's becoming also into the restaurants with different shapes and different things. And one of the things that I will show you with the shawarma titin combination that is becoming a whole meal. The shawarma become famous due to a Turk that moved to work in Germany in 1960, 62, and he was working almost 10 years in the market. And around the 70s, 72, he discovered, or he observed that uh, the people moving in the market, they're eating hot dogs and hamburgers and all kind of fast food. And he was thinking that home, the donor kebab, what is called the, the shawarma in Turkish is donor kebab, can be a very good thing in Germany. And really, he bought one of these things and he started working and he passed away about seven, eight years ago at age of 80. He never registered the patent art, otherwise would have been a very, very rich man because eight years ago already, alone in Berlin, was about 16,000 uh, shawarmarias or little shawarma stands, you know, selling this fast food from Germany spread it to other places in Europe and also become very popular in Israel. Uh, without any connection, Israeli also made the shawarma but was not so popular when we're talking back before the 80s or let's put it this way, the late 70s. The falafel was the dominant one and many other type of hummus and uh, simple food. The shawarma become a very good response to a quick meal and a tasty one, a lot of flavors. And the thing that used to be put in a pita or lafa, what is a bigger 
pita that is rolled up uh, become popular because you could have different salads and different uh, sauces to it and you could have keep on going without spending time later on become popular to sit down and have with pickles and chips or other types of added uh, uh, dishes. So the points the same in Greece and uh, the shawarma Greek in uh, Greece it's called uh, gyro. Again, the same really gyro is moving around or turning around uh, as a Greek word, and they using it in a pita that is not open as a pocket, but is using, used as a pita made with, with sauces and uh, different things. Also, is not in a kosher way because mainly it's used of pork. And because of that, they also use tzatziki, what is not in a kosher world, because yogurt and mint and um, you don't use with meat. So we keep our, the, our, our in a kosher way and Later on, the Lebanese who emigrated to Mexico in uh, Southern America, they took the shawarma mechanism with them. And one of the famous things, what is called today tacos and pastore, actually is the shawarma that is turning and become a national food in uh, Mexico and South America. Okay, that's regarding the shawarma. If you will have questions, please pass it to Lisa. She will pass it to me, will answer you. In the meantime, we'll talk about the team that's going to be the other ingredient combined with the shawarma, because our shawarma is going to be different. We're not going to have it on a big machine turning around, because as, she, as I told you in the beginning, shawarma was sliced very thinly and immediately packed inside the pita or the lafa or on the plate with other salad. Uh, and it's going very quickly that we've seen that in South Africa because there was not such a big demand like in Israel. Let's say Ramat Gan was the famous uh, shawarmaria or the shawarma stand called Shemesh restaurant that you hardly had a place to stand, but they used to sell like two huge rolls or turns about 500 kilo each a day. So many people turn around that. The pita used to be big and you had to put your own salads and your own sauces. You could have used the yamba because a lot of uh, Iraqi and Jews living around Ramat Gan. They used the pickles, the chilies uh, and chips. And there was a big pita. With time, the pita becomes smaller, meat becomes more expensive. So the pita becomes smaller to be more uh, agreeable to the owners. And later on, they even changed it to a square pita. But I think the Chemish in a way passed and uh, many other places that were used to be famous for my disappointment today, like Keter of Mizrach in Tel Aviv, they closed. It happened that the old people, or they passed away or they retired and the sons didn't want to continue like many other things today. The youngsters always lose for other things, but Shwarma is still popular. In South Africa, become very popular. You have a few places, and the famous was Anat, Falafel, and Shawarma that everybody knows was all over South Africa. You have the Shawarma Company, Norwood, and many other Lebanese or other places or Greek places, they're using the Shawarma, or the Giros, as they call it. And everybody liked it, and definitely, you know, the kosher places also had it. So what happened is that because it's not a big demand and the quantity, you don't want to spoil the meat, they used to bring the, the vertical skew closer to the fire and then the outside of the meat is scorched or fried and you slice thin slices but you don't, inside the meat still be left raw. Sometimes when they had to do it quicker, they used to cut off and then warm it up or finish it on the plancha, on a, on a flat pan. Uh, definitely with the spice and a little oil, it was the same way very popular and quick. So what happened from this is actually that certain chain stores and delicatessen stores, they start selling the sliced meat already and the shawarma spices or the mixed uh, meat with the spices and you went home and you could have done it in your own frying pan. So from that thing, 
I think that many of the people in Israel and other parts of the world, they don't have the time or they come home for work and they want a quick meal, they take out from the fridge what they have and they done it quickly and the children are happy and the family is happy for a quick meal, nice and uh, flavorful. So from this reason, our meat is cut in small cubes evenly that will cook the same and you don't need to have the whole equipment uh, for the shawarma that is not so easy because it takes a lot of time you know to do it. I used to make, I have a little one in, in Johannesburg, more or less like 50, 55 centimeter high. Used to take a deboned chicken, spice it to the shawarma spices, roll it up and put it in the fridge overnight. The next day when I wanted to do, let's say on the Sunday, we have a braai or something like that, used to cut in two. And by this, the rolled up chicken that had white meat and the brown meat and the spices and the skin that was flavoring like putting fat, uh, used to juice it and uh, moisten uh, the shawarma. And then you just had to, with a sharp knife, to cut nice slices and people could have it uh, straight. But as I say, you can put two chickens on this machine and not always is enough. But in a pan, you can have more and in the wok and you can do it very quickly. The Mario, shawarma operates sorry, on Mario, sorry to interrupt. Meat. Yes. Just won't you move that power cable just away? Here we go. Thank you. Marius, can, can I just ask a question? I know yes. in South Africa, so many restaurants have been affected by the pandemic. What is the situation in Israel with the shawarma vendors? There's so many of them and the falafel vendors. What is the situation in Israel with the restaurants? Lots of closed? Look, uh, when I came here, when we arrived about two months ago, there was a problem that you could have only takeaways, restaurants being closed. And even today, there is a problem, there is a limitation that you can have 20 people inside and 30 people outside, but mainly outside. So being hot and warm at the moment is no problem. People are sitting and eating. But definitely the hospitality industry, the restaurant, they're suffering in Israel as well as in South Africa. The good news I heard last night from South Africa, the restaurants will be open and other, other places. So it's going towards that, but uh, opposite to the situation in South Africa, where I see that the, the tahlua, the, the, whole, the, the people sick, it's coming down in Israel, unfortunately, it's going up. People are not very disciplined here and they don't, they just moving around. Uh, lately, there is a threat that maybe for the Hagim will be a complete lockdown because otherwise it's too mixed. Unfortunately, on the areas of the Mew team, uh, where the Arab villages are, they don't give too much and they have big weddings or haflot or parties and the mixing and they don't, everybody is not, uh, putting up the mask or doing the sanitation properly, and it's very high, the, contagi the contagiousness there. The same with the Haridim, and uh, the numbers are talking for themselves. There are big uh, ilulot and bar mitzvot and all kind of things that happening, and the shuls, definitely people need to pray. They come into certain arrangement, how it's gonna be. I was glad to hear the Green Park Synagogue is coming also online with 50 people. So finally, they're gonna have a minion. In Israel, we had minions in the street, but that was stopped also by the police because the numbers grew and you're not allowed to be more than 20 people. The wedding industry, the bar mitzvah industry suffers here the same. People are doing it maybe illegally in different houses, but after that, they will have to pay the, the price, unfortunately, that people get sick more and more. What we need is patient. This thing doesn't go away very quickly, will take some time, and you have to know to live with it. So I'm happy they relax more in South Africa. If everybody's gonna be more careful, then it's gonna go because the danger is to have a second wave. Okay, let's come back to the food. So the industry of restaurant, they're suffering in Israel as well, and they're famous and big restaurants, and many of them went to the fast food, and many of them doing on takeaways, but you know, it's not the same. Somebody would like to go on. One thing, there was never a, a ban here on cigarettes or 
or drinks, alcoholic drinks, so the restaurant could have sell it. In South Africa, the restaurant which are the wine, they can't make their own profit, so it's difficult, but it's coming right now. All right, so the shawarma, to come back to the shawarma, shawarma was made on a big skew, where the meat is marinated with spices and different and put on layer. The doner kebab, the Turkish doner kebab is made of mince meat, spiced with tomatoes and vegetables in between, and it's like a big hamburger. You put layers and layers. The other way is to make it layer of meat or layer of, I mean, solid meat. And that can be mutton, lamb, cow, chicken, turkey, or non-kosher products that I don't mention. But in, the, in those layers, the spice in the top will be some lamb fat that gives a special flavor as it melts and comes down and moist the, the meat. And definitely the spices and for the beauty, they put the tomato on the top so you can have a tomato, it looks nice. Also the moist from the tomato comes down. We're gonna make our blend of spices and it's very much recommended for this dish to use the extra on our mix of spices, also the shawarma spice. The shawarma spice will give this dish a complete flavor of shawarma and it's going to be fantastic. So, as I said, we're going to make the mixture of spices. So we take a bowl and I put some salt and I put the cumin, like a teaspoon. You have the numbers of ingredients, black pepper, turmeric, and the shawarma spice. Okay, now I'm gonna mix it. I like to put a little bit chili in mine. You don't have to if you don't like, but a little chili will give you a little bit fire. We do a good mix and we're only gonna use half of this spice mixture. Now for those who couldn't get the shawarma spices, in the bottom of the ingredients, you have the possibility how to make a shawarma meat. Every area in Turkey, they don't use so much spicy food. In the Arab countries, they use a little bit more and they use baharat. Baharat is a mixture of spice like the Indian have a garam masala or any type of other mixture. The Arab also have a use of spice, what is called ras al khanut, mainly North Africa or Arab countries, Ras al Khanud, the head of the, of the shop. If you went in, in the spice shop, whatever he had, and every spice shop has a little bit of mixture of his own, so it's very unique, and different regions, they have different flavors, but the principle is the same. You use turmeric, you use salt, you use pepper, little paprika, and some of the people are using cardamom, but in Hebrew it's hell. You can use some old spices, you can use a uh, little bit of cinnamon powder, depends from which area. The Druze in Israel like a lot of cinnamon eating, not too strong, but a little bit in the background, lingering, not everybody likes it, but it's welcome. So you can make your own shawarma spices if you can't buy it ready, but if you can buy it ready, then you just mix it with other spices that we have, and we're gonna use half of it to mix with our meat. What we need Mario, some, somebody's asking, where, do you know if it's possible to buy shawarma spice anywhere in First South Africa? All, you can buy them everywhere, mainly in Woolworth or Pick and Pace, or if you go to shawarma company, you had, uh, I don't know what is today the, the refillment from Israel, but the Israeli shop on the strip, uh, normally they all had it and it's no problem to make it. You can buy a shawarma spice in little plastic bags or little containers like those. So that's not the problem. Uh, maybe today, but as I say, you can have a mixture of spices and you can make your own. So let's hope that most of you manage to get some shawarma spices because that's gonna be the flavor. So we're gonna take our meat, we're gonna put it in a bowl and we're gonna take half of the quantity of those spices and we're gonna put it on the meat. The other half, we're gonna keep it for later use. Okay, and the secret ingredients to this is like half a teaspoon or a teaspoon, depends on the quantity. I have here one kilo meat, 
We're gonna be eight people for dinner tonight here. So I'm adding this inside and I'm gonna add a little bit of oil, like two, two spoons of oil. Can be vegetable oils or any type of oil that you have. And you can also use olive oil if you like, but not necessarily. So we mix this well and we're gonna leave it for 10 minutes that the flavor will penetrate the meat. If you use chicken breast, it's gonna be very easy because it's cooking quickly. Those are chicken thighs because I want a little bit more moisture. Unfortunately, they cut it for me very thin uh, by the butcher and I didn't pay attention that they are not cubed. So we cut them a little bit wider. All right, now we're gonna make, we're gonna put this aside and we're gonna take time, 10 minutes. Okay, now it's half past. In the meantime, we're going to the, to the stove and we start our, on a high heat. We're gonna put the rest of the oil. And as the oil, the oil will come to, to get warm, we're gonna put in roughly chopped onions. All right, we're gonna mix it. And if you work on high heat, then you have to see that you don't burn the onion because they caramelize very quickly. And then they can burn. Normally, take some time until the onions will warm up and then they will move very fast. So you keep stirring that and you reduce the heat to medium heat. All right, when the onions We'll start getting softer. They don't need to be brown. They, we want them to be translucent because they're gonna keep cooking with the meat. So, okay, so this is working high heat. In the meantime, we can talk about the pitim. Okay, the titim or the Israeli couscous called came into fashion or into use in Israel in the 50s. Ben Gurion called one of the establishers of Osem, a guy called Eugene Proper, a Czech guy from Czechoslovakia who left on the 30s when the Nazis took over and came to Israel after his father passed away and he took with him the equipment and established a small little pasta factory in Tel Aviv. On those years, up to the 50s, was approximately 32 little pasta factories. In the 50s started the big Aliyah to Israel from the North African countries, Morocco, Tunis, Algiers, some of them from Egypt, some of them from Libya and also from Iraq. So other neighboring countries also become a big emigration. And the basic food was couscous or rice. Israel at that time, during the austerity period, or Sena called, had a problem of foreign exchange and they couldn't buy rice. So what they, when Gurion called one of these little factory managers that later become the big conglomerate, Osem, uh, he told them, look, we need to have a pasta that will look like rice or couscous that we can feed the people because flour was coming at those, in those years from America and was no problem to make a pasta. So being the Czech middle European country and Ashkenazi Jews, the farfalle was very popular in the time. Farfalle is a type of pasta that you make a dough flour, eggs, and water, and maybe a pinch of salt, and you make a very hard dough, and then you grate it, or you cut it, or you chop it, and you put it on in the sun and rice, and then used to be for Shabbat's meal, or made into sauces, or made. I will call my friend to steal the onion, otherwise we're gonna burn it. So Eugene Proper came to Ben Gurion and he said, okay, we can make a short 
a shortcut pasta that looks like rice. And at that time, you to, they call it tutem and had the shape of the rice. If you're gonna look in the shop, mainly Portuguese shops, but also in the pick and pay, you have the pasta rice or orzo. There are many, matful, it's a Corsican dish. It's, you can, it's everybody popular. It's not rice, but looks like rice or uh, made of, of dough, durum or wheat. The other one that they started making was little pellets, like the couscous, a little bit bigger, so it's, that's why they call it Israeli couscous, because they know the other type of, uh, other type of uh, spices, I mean, uh, the couscous. And in Israel, it become very popular with children. So it's a quick dish to make. Uh, you fry some onion, you mix it with the pasta, you let a little bit brown. I have friends, they like it blonde, and other like a little bit more brown, and then you add water. The secret is to add to the type of pasta, one and a half, up to two, depends how hard it is. One of them are softer, the other one are harder. Uh, the quantity and must be boiling water. If you don't put boiling water, it will stick and will not come out nice. One, one and one, like little pearls. And that's the whole idea that we want to do it with hot water. So you brown it a little bit, and that will promise you that if you brown those uh, pellets a little bit, they will be nice and pearly. Maurice, can I just ask those people who were unable to buy the titim, what is another yeah. something else that they can serve the, the chicken shawarma with? And it's called orzo. Orzo, it's okay. Like a, a, or it's like a rice pasta. It looks like rice, but it's pasta. Or you can use a big grain couscous that you can get, or you can use a smaller type of couscous, or you make your own pasta. So okay. any short type of pasta, you actually, if you find very little today, in Israel, they make the petit, not only pellets and rice shape, but they also make little star and other type of uh, little, little uh, small, tiny pasta. And if you don't have, you can, uh, break the spaghetti, you know, and you can mix it, small pieces if you can, it's a little bit more work, but it is possible. I don't think that is a problem to get the couscous or the pitim today in South Africa. And if not, maybe it's a good business to start sending over some. Any case, my onion is right. So what I'm gonna do now, we are just about five minutes, so we're gonna reduce a little bit. And the one thing that is a little trick, if you get the onion start burning and it's going too quick, you add a little bit of water. Okay. And that will slow down the caramelization. And you hear the noise of the steam. Come on. Avion. Yes, you're on. We can see the, the onions beautifully. Okay. It started browning too quickly, so added a little water and then moist it. And we'll regain another five minutes to mix in the meat. Okay, I have to turn the camera, sorry. And we're back in picture. So, the onion is burning and we've been with the pitim. So they make today in Israel pitim, colorful for the children. You can, it's called uh, couscous, but the shloshat way, they have three different colors. You have orange, a green, and a white one, or you can have two white ones whatever you like, and they come normally in half a kilo packs. So for this purpose, we're gonna use two packets because I have a kilo meat, so all the spices are actually a little bit double, but you don't need to double the quantities of spices, it's gonna be enough spicy for you. Okay, so time-wise, we have another three minutes. In the meantime, we can talk about the team. So as I say, 
all these little factories with time, they united together and they started manufacturing and become a very big item. And the children are like it. And if you fry some onion and then you put in the pasta, you fry it for two, three minutes. And then you add a little bit of tomato paste and you're gonna mix it and you're gonna add boiling water. Let's say for half a kilo, you're gonna have two cups or two, three cups of water, which is about 750 mils. And you're gonna cook them nicely and the children are gonna eat it. It's nice and moist, it's very popular here. So that's why I wanted to have something that is very Israeli to make the South African aware to it. And it's a very easy and uh, nice dish to have, especially in winter time. Okay, now we're gonna put in the meat. Can you see me from there? Okay. We can't see the pot. I don't know if you want to move the uh, camera so they can see the Can you see it? Yes, great. Okay, we're mixing with the meat. The meat also doesn't have to cook completely. We want to leave it a little bit on the pinky side. As it start getting whiter, that means the meat is start cooking, but don't forget you still have to go sometimes. So at least not 10 minutes we want to cook. Okay, let me connect back the electricity that we don't run out of power in the phone. Okay, here we are. So we give it, and as the meat will start changing the colors, we're going to add the rest of the ingredients. That is going to be the, the spring onion, chopped, the parsley, chopped, the crushed garlic. As more you put a bit more flavor, the room is going to be full of flavor. But before that, we're going to put in the kitty. So my quantities are a little bit bigger, it may take a little bit more time, but we all come in just now because it's getting brown. It's a big finish. All right, let me open the team. Okay, we put the color one also. So for a kilo of meat, I have a kilo of 900 gram actually of, of the pasta. All right. Uh, now what we're gonna do, we wait a little bit for those little brown things to brown a little bit. And as I say, maybe I should have gone on a half a kilo and then make for the rest of the guests here because we don't want them to wait too long. When this pasta, they start browning a little bit, we're gonna add in Can you see me there? No. Okay, now we, we can, no, we can't really see the pot. There you go. Can you aim the, cam, the, the phone into the pot so we can see? Okay, they're fantastic. Thank you. Great. Okay, we need to reduce the heat because otherwise it's burn. So you're frying the petit tim with the onions and the chicken. So we fry them with the onion and the meat. Okay. And we want them to get a little bit of color. And then we're gonna put in the spring onion. We're gonna put in the parsley, 
There's more, the better, the garlic, and the rest of the spices. Okay, we give a good stir. I think I'm going to change the... I have to say that looks absolutely delicious, Marius. Good. I wish we could smell what you're smelling, the aromas it's that it's you're it's creating there. I will bring the camera to the pot and we have to mix it. You can smell the garlic and the freshness of the green vegetables and the spice of the shawarma. Marius, the comments here, people are saying that you're making them very hungry. And somebody asked... You're supposed to prepare it with me and then eat it, no? <laughs> That's why we prepared the list of ingredients. Well, not everybody can cook with us today. Some people are just watching. Well, I'm doing it very slowly for everybody to be face with me. Okay. What is important is a leaf and a towel because we want to capture the moist in the pot. All right, in the meantime, this is going, we have a lid here. We're gonna put the towel. Okay, we added 750 and we're going to add another one. And by this, we actually can see that, that the bottom will not burn. Okay, we're reducing the heat and we're going to cook it at least 10, 10 minutes. And definitely with chicken breast will go much quicker. Could you yes, make this? Does. Could you make this not with chicken, maybe with with beef or you another can make kind it of with protein? Beef, it will take longer. You have to cook the meat much longer than chicken. We use the chicken because it's quicker, but okay. you can use beef, lamb, or whatever you like with that spicing thing. You will just have to cook that the meat will come uh, softer, because chicken meat cooks very quickly. You don't need half an hour. On beef, depends how old is the beef. You know, you have to put more. Okay, so now we mix this well. We're gonna bring it to a boil. And when it's boiling, we're gonna reduce the heat and cover it with a towel and put the lid. Okay. All right, so we're gonna have a little interval. If there are any, What we're gonna do is a little interval just now, but before that, if there are any questions regarding the, the shawarma team, because we'll prepare in the meantime the fish and this will cook, so we'll not keep you the whole evening here. If anybody's got any questions about this recipe, please post them, and I will ensure that Marius answers your questions. In the meantime, while uh, you guys are posting your uh, questions, I am going to play a short video about uh, some of the important work that the South African Zionist Federation and the South African Friends of Israel are doing during this time of virus. <laughs> For over 100 years, the South African Zionist Federation has been the bridge between South Africa and Israel, bringing the best of the Holy Land to the beloved country, and vice versa. That's why, during this time of unprecedented corona crisis, the Fed is working tirelessly to access the latest medical technology from Israel, so that we can contribute 
to the national fight against COVID-19. Just recently, for example, the SAZF partnered with Israeli startup Sonovia Tech to donate cutting-edge medical masks to Hatzola Medical Rescue. And the Israeli-developed Chagai volunteer food delivery application is being used with great success to facilitate food deliveries within the Jewish community. Meanwhile, the SAZF's flagship program, South African Friends of Israel, is also stepping up to the plate. SAFI is an organization dedicated to creating a united coalition with other religious, cultural and ethnic groups in the interests of building a broader grassroots support base for Israel in South Africa. SAFI's activities include combating BDS and other delegitimization campaigns, hosting events and gatherings for a diverse community of pro-Israel advocates, and supporting public figures, such as the Chief Justice of South Africa, who have come under fire for their views. Now, in this time of pandemic, our friends and supporters need our help. That's why SAFI has been busy organizing food parcels and feeding schemes, offering a much needed lifeline to thousands of people who are going hungry as a result of the ongoing pandemic. With no jobs, no food, a deteriorating economy and bitter winter weather, the situation really is dire. So please, let's come together as a community to help the Fed and SAFI keep hunger at bay. You can show your support by making a deposit into our dedicated coronavirus fund. No amount is too small and every cent we raise will go towards putting food on the tables of our society's most vulnerable members. Make your donation now using these payment details. Be a light unto the nations by making your contribution today. And please share this video to spread the word about Israeli tech fighting COVID-19. The South African Zionist Federation and South African Friends of Israel, making a difference where it matters most. Thank you, everyone. Once again, there are the details. If you can, if you're in a position to, please do make a contribution to the SAFI COVID fund. Uh, no amount is too big or too small. There are the details on your screen. It will be very much appreciated. Uh, while we are in the interval, um, I'm also going to quickly tell you about two upcoming events that we have uh, from the Fed. Um, we have uh, Mohammed Zwabi exploring Israeli society with uh, Mohammed Zawabi, Israel, Israeli Arab and social activist. That is this coming Thursday. And then the following Thursday, we have an exclusive conversation with the writer, director and producer of a new film called Golda, about Golda Meir. Um, Udi Nir is going to be uh, with us for an exclusive conversation. So that's definitely something you don't want to miss. Save the date for that one the following Thursday. Uh, I'm now going to hand over back to Lisa and Marius to carry on with their cooking demonstration. Thank you. I think I hope Marius is ready. Marius, are you ready to, to can continue? We can't hear you. We still can't hear you on mute, Marius. Unmute yourself, please. Okay, sorry. There you uh, go. The second dish is called Dag Mizrahi. It's a combination of infusion between the, the Libyan Chrime or Tripolitai climate that we call in Israel, and between the Moroccan uh, uh, chili fish or peppery fish, what is called. Uh, for that, for this purpose, we're gonna need some good fish. Okay, you can use any type of fish. If you want, you can have the skin off. If it's a very soft fish, leave the skin on because we'll keep the fish Integrity will not get into pieces. We're going to need some chopped tomato, some red pepper chopped into strips. We're going to have some tomato sauce as well, or chopped tomatoes. We're going to need some chili peppers. You can have them dry, sweet, or chili, and you don't have to boil them in hot water, not necessarily. We have coriander. Coriander with stalks and coriander chopped for garnish. We have some parsley, we have a lot of garlic, and we have some chili. And then the spices again that we're gonna make the mix 
and you will see just now how it's going. It's turmeric, red sweet paprika, some coriander, black pepper, a little cumin, and the ingredients that is used by the uh, Tripolitan or the Libyan Jews to make the trima is some great, grated kimmel or caraway seed. That gives a special type of uh, flavor for this dish and it's very important to have it. So the combination, and I will explain just now what's the difference between the two and you're gonna understand it. Let me just return the camera. That is not muted, okay. Are we all right? Can we see each other? All right, the chrime, it's for the, this oriental fish is originated from Northern Africa mainly. There are two types of this fish that is prepared. It's a Shabbat dish, mainly for Friday night or Friday afternoon, before Shabbos they used to eat and the Mizrahi families uh, is made of the ingredients of vegetables and the fish in a very red sauce. Both of them, they're using a red sauce. Red sauce, that means the oil, the paprika, and the spices, and the tomatoes. Now, the difference between the chrime, the Libyan chrime, or the Tripoli, Tripoli in Libya, or Benghazi, uh, what, what the difference uh, is between the Moroccan one, the Moroccan was used a lot of peppers, and the Libyan one, they don't use any peppers, only tomato base. The Libyan have a mixture of spices called pilpil chuma, filfil chuma. Filfil is pepper, paprika, and chuma is uh, garlic. So mixture of garlic and the main spice, the cumin, made into a very thick paste fried in oil. And then you have it like a paste. This is the main ingredient used for the chrime. The Moroccans, they use a lot of type of peppers, sweet peppers and uh, chili peppers, a lot of coriander, a lot of parsley and other vegetables, and definitely the spices that is some cumin, turmeric, paprika, the same, and tomato paste. So here we're gonna do infusion with the Libyan and the Moroccan like this. Nobody's gonna have argument. No, we make it this way, this way, because every region actually has a different type of mixture of spices and every region, and if you're talking about North Africa, is definitely under the Berberic uh, influence. And they use a lot of lemons and olive oils and stuff that was not used so much at the time as a tomato that came in a lot later stage. The Tunisian one actually is similar, or there is a similarity between the Libyan one and the Moroccan and the Algerian ones are with the peppers and the other ingredients, a lot of garlic so as well. So if I show you the ingredients, we'll repeat it again, we come again that you remember. We'll start with the oil and we have good olive oil for that. All right, you can use also regular use canola oil, some sunflower oils, any oil, but those dishes are quite rich in oil. So those who want to have diet, you use a little bit and you will use a little bit more of the tomato and the peppers or the other vegetables. Okay, so let's come and start making the dish. And just tell me if you can see it. If you are in the picture, okay. The ingredients. Yes, we can, okay. we can see start, all the ingredients. You start with a good portion of oil. And we're talking like a third cup of oil. And you need to have this oil because in the soil, as the oil will start warming up, we're gonna put in the, the spices like they're doing at the Indian food. You know, they, they put in the Oh, I must have an accident here. Pots are big and the stove is small. Are you with me? Yes, we're with you. Okay, sorry for that. Okay, so we're gonna start, as the oil will start warming up, we're gonna put in the spices. The spices, oh, sorry. The timer is giving me that we have to take off the lid from the 
Shoagma, we have to come back to it and we have to give him a mix. And I just want to show you. Sorry. Okay, here we are. You can see it's still moist. We have to give him a good steer. We took off the towel with the lid. We're mixing it. And then what we're going to do, we're going to put back the towel and we cover with the lid, but we're going to switch off. I just want to see if it's enough cooked because the quantities are bigger. You know, this one. Okay, I'm putting the towel back. Okay, so here we are, the oil in the pan. We start warming it and we're gonna be back. Okay, so we take the pepper, the paprika, the red paprika, sweet paprika, we mix it into the oil. The turmeric, The cumin, don't put too much cumin. Cumin is very dominant. The black pepper, some salt. And the caraway seed. And if you don't have caraway seed, what is important for the Libyan world, but if you don't have it, you can put caraway seed whole, but they may they may crunch in your teeth, so better to have it grated in a coffee ground that you can do that. All right, we're gonna mix the spices, otherwise they burn. And as they start opening, they're releasing the flavor, you're gonna put in the chopped tomato, otherwise it's gonna burn. Okay, the chopped tomato has enough uh, moisture not to burn the spices because spices burn quickly. All right, we give a good stir. We're gonna put in all the other peppers, the red peppers. Now I have a Israeli green chili. If you don't want it to have to chili the dish, what you have to do, you cut a few, uh, I mean, you put it in whole. And if you want to have it more chili, you cut it. As you open the, the, the heat from the inside will go more into the dish. Uh, I'm putting a Thai chili, not always uh, so strong. I have a few dry chilies, okay? And as I mentioned before, you don't have to boil them or put them in hot water. They're good enough, they will cook into it. And they're sweet, they're not so chilly. And I put a little bit of chili flakes and a lot of garlic. Marius, I, can, I just, I, can I just interrupt you? Somebody's asked here two questions actually. What is the purpose of the towel on the pot the for the shawarma? The, 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 the steam. The towel absorbs the steam and by this, you know, doesn't escape and the, the, like you're cooking rice. In rice cooking, it's very much used to cover, you know, so it's, the it's to seal the pot. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm mixing now the ingredients here that we put in. I'm going to put in the chopped tomatoes, and we need some water for this. So I'm using the tomato tin, and by this I'm washing up the extra, and putting it in. I have some celery stalk, it's not in the recipe, but you can add it. I had it, so I don't want to waste it. I'm using it into this dish. And I'm using a lot of uh, tomato paste.
the tomato paste will thicken, has a little bit toughness as well, and will thicken the sauce. And what we need after that is to mix well with the water. If you want, you can fry the tomato paste just as you're adding the tomatoes. It's not so important because we cook slowly and the flavors will blend in. Other thing that is important for this is actually to have uh, the fish prepared. So this sauce will cook for about 10 minutes. In the meantime, we have to put some lemon juice on the fish, not more than 10 minutes. Otherwise you have a ceviche, it's going to be cooked by the olive oil, uh, by the lem lemon. We put a little bit salt. Can you see me like that? Yes. Yes, you can see. Okay, we put a little salt. And we're going to cut some lemon. We're going to put some lemon juice on it. On the fish. That used to be put at the time that the fish, wa the fish was not so fresh when they used to grow it ham. Today in modern supermarkets and fisheries, you get nice fillets, packed vacuum or not. At that time, you used to bring the fish home and had a little bit fishy smell and you wanted to get rid of it. So, okay, the alarm is going and making noises. Mixing the sauce, it looks beautiful. We'll see what the vibrant color has at the moment. Oh, looks that good. really does look delicious. Unbelievable. Okay, I will have to taste it later on to see if I have to. Add it. What is important to tomato sauce, always add a little bit of sugar, like a teaspoon. Sugar is something that balances out the chili, the tartness, the sourness, or the saltiness. So I'm putting confined of a spoon. I'm using more or less like a teaspoon of, of sugar that will neutralize or balance out the flavors. It's used many times in the cooking where you're gonna put in some sugar to get rid of certain saltness or chilliness or sourness. In any case, brings out the flavor very nicely. So the fish is nicely salted and lemon it's always good to add especially the tripolitais they like lemon you can slice some lemon like this and you can put it in the dish you can grate some lemon zest and you can put it in it will be nice and flavorful i'm using lemon and i'm going to cut some slices And I will put them in. Mm. Tastes already good. Okay, we'll show you again. You see the slices of lemon, and then you can squeeze a little bit of lemon Looks juice. gorgeous, beautiful. A little bit of lemon juice. It's always nice, will brighten the colors. Okay, we'll taste a little bit to see if the sauce too chili or too sour or too whatever. fine. I don't mind a little bit more chili. Maybe a little bit more salt. Okay, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to put my coriander with the stalk. The stalk has a lot of flavors. Okay, in the Moroccan fish, it's used a lot. In the Tripolitai, is not. And then we have 
the sauce oh nicely chilly now the flavor of the coriander will grow into it and now i'm going to do is if the 10 minutes past i'm going to take the fish and i'm going to put it inside the sauce what is important that you have like three quarter of the fish covered into sauce doesn't have to be completely uh, in it you can cut smaller portions or bigger portions and this is more or less how it's going to look then we're going to take an the cuff we're going to take some of the sauce and pour on the top everybody who's cooking with us today if you could just upload your photographs of the finished dishes to our Facebook pages so we can have a look. Um, Marius, uh, yeah. Adrian's asking which South African fish would be suitable for this dish? The king clip, definitely rock cod. Uh, any type of sea fish, what is harder, not too soft, but you can make it from hake as well. And hake is a little bit, little bit uh, uh, soft. So leave it with the skin. Uh, just see that it's clean, it's killed nicely. And, uh, okay, here we are with the, you see it's done now. You're gonna switch off the fryer. I said to you, I said to you, I said Okay, the fish what is about you? What about using salmon? You can use salmon. I had for Friday night at my family Shabbos dinner salmon. It was quite nice. Uh, salmon is not very expensive in South Africa and you can use it. Nice to see that it's firm. Okay. The rest of the coriander and the parsley, I'm going to put it in. But the rest of the coriander, I will use it for a garnish at the end. Okay. okay, so now we have colors. You see red, green, white, the fish, almost like the Hungarian, my origin flag or Italian flag, but it's nice like this. Okay. And now what we have to wait, my friend is tasty, very you good, say it's good. good. Ah, you see, my critics. Everybody, this is my friend to meet, everybody, everybody wants to meet your, your friend and your, uh, your helper. Hi, hi everyone. <laughs> nice to meet you from, from Israel. Alon is my buddy that whenever I came to South Africa, we go out on a gourmet tour. And when I told him that I'm going to make this uh, program, he offered his place and said, please, nobody will bother you, not your wife. Not the kids <laughs> and not the friends, whatever, not even the dog will bark. So you're welcome to come here and do it at me. And like this, he was actually the sous chef, but he gives the command in his kitchen in any case. And uh, if you're going to look on the... Sous chef with an opinion. <laughs> sous chef with the opinion. And mm, it's nice, fresh. Good. We're gonna have it for supper later on. <laughs> okay, that's the fish really cooking. both dishes look incredible. Absolutely incredible, Marius. I hope they will taste also incredible. One thing you don't have to cook it too long. The fish gets cooked in 50 minutes, uh, maximum 20 minutes if it's bigger pieces or thicker pieces or harder fish. Now, the chrayme is eaten with a fresh challah on Friday night, whereby you have to put in tunki 
and definitely a white fresh challah absorbs the sauce and goes well with that thing. So if you're gonna prepare it for Shabbos, definitely get hold of white bread, a fresh baguette, or anything like that. All right, so here are the two dishes ready to be eaten. It's better to be served. To be served Which, what, what, what kind of fish are you using, Marius? I'm using a, a kosher fish, a scale fish. Uh, I don't know the Israeli name, it's too complicated to remember. But it's very similar to the zebra. Okay. The zebra in South Africa, or the cod. In Israel, they cod. call it locus. Okay. Locus. Okay. Locus. Or rock cod. And tell me the chrima. In South I... Africa, they are Sibas about or four. They have. Uh, a yellow one, they have a pink one, they have a black one, and they have a grayish one. So whatever you can get normally come from Mozambique, and it's a kosher fish. You scale it, you cut them in, uh, in the Israeli cookie. Normally, cooking normally you have to take with the bone. The Israelis like to eat the fish on the bone. South Africans are more spoiled. They like to have uh, as a Filet, and then no problem with the kids or bother to get out the bones, but the bones inside the fish will give you a better taste and the sauce will become good. It's giving me to taste the sauce on a piece of baguette. Today is Sunday, the challah is not fresh, only Friday. But it's good. Okay, the water is that I can keep speaking and it's becoming very, very hot. Just so, another question, Marius. What is the traditional fish that is used to make chrime? In Israel, they use buri. It's not available in South Africa. Amnun, uh, carp, any type of fish actually you can get today. They have lavrak, they have dennis, uh, names that are not so familiar in South Africa. But they're coming and they work out very nicely. I think the fish in about five minutes is going to be ready. Could you also add you perhaps like, nice like chickpeas? You could, you, could you add chickpeas to this, uh, to this dish or not? Yeah, you can add after that. Look, the original thing was that chrime in Arabic means forbidden. The sauce used to be made into a red sauce, as I told, with potato carrots, peppers, or the Libyan by only tomato sauce with a lot of garlic and the kimmel, uh, ground, grounded kimmel that gives the flavor. Lot of garlic and chili, and then lemon juice. So chrime means something forbidden because with the time, as I mentioned on the shawarma couscous, that when they arrived from North Africa, and there was no time because they had to work. They used to skip the phase where they cook the sauce with potato, uh, the carrots and other veggies. They went straight to the sauce with sauce and uh, tomato paste. And that was like forbidden. It's also mean haval, a shame, because you don't make the sauce completely. But Today, they use potato. Some of the people use cooked chickpeas already because if it's not cooked, don't put it, it will take hours to cook. But in Israel, you can buy frozen in packets and you just have to add it in, they cooked already. Or you can buy in South Africa tins of chickpeas and you can add it to your dish or slices of thin potatoes. And as I put some celery, you can add any type of vegetables to make into a night broth and then the fish is gonna be much, much flavorful. Uh, this is, that's why it's called chrime, because it was a shame that was not used complete the whole process of preparing that sauce. That's very interesting. Um, are there any other questions from the, from the audience? Anybody else got any questions for Marius about any of the dishes? Would you like me to plate it or it's enough like this to understand because we will eat later. 
But no, if need for the... I don't think there's a need to plate it. <laughs> Somebody's asked gonna... if, if, if you deliver. Do you deliver takeaways to South Africa, Marius? Anytime. <laughs> Just let me in a plane. I bring it personally. Well, we're waiting to have you back so we can actually have uh, go back to our, our cooking classes on Hope a regular basis. Hope it's going to happen soon. Hope it's going to happen soon. And if not, I hope so too. we'll do it from here again. Absolutely. Um, so everybody who's, everybody's been listening to us, if you have any dishes or any uh, uh, preferred uh, cuisine that you would like Marius to, to teach us, please send us an email or write in the chat. Um, the, the session is recorded and a YouTube link will be put onto to our Facebook page um, as well as onto the cooking group. So you can watch it later as well. Okay, what we've done before in the cooking up in Hebrew programs, that was different uh, ethnic groups of Israel that we cooked, Ethiopian and uh, Polish, Russian and Hungarian and Persian and Iraqi and Indian. We done everything. So if it's anything that you would like, specific Israeli, because if you're talking about Israeli food today, it's very little identified, as I say, as Israeli, even that Israeli keeps pridely, that is their food. Most of them come from Turkey, most of them come from Arab influences or Mediterranean influences, Ashkenazi influences. <laughs> You know, it was different food ever eaten the Mizrahi food, was flavors that you couldn't taste. Uh, you couldn't understand them. We had a Moroccan neighbor and in the building, when we walked in, I used to pass first day, Friday night, the smell of coriander and the fish and, and the peppers and the things, I couldn't take it. It was for me very, very, how should I put it, powerful. And my mother used to make the gefilte fish from carp, you know, with the mix and it was a different flavor. With time, after a year or something, my mother made friend, her name was also Miriam, like my mother's, and they exchanged the recipes. And you should have seen the Moroccans making gefilte fish with Moroccan spices, and my mother making this chili fish. And since that, I'm enjoying it. Only in South Africa, I learned in 1980s when I came, to like the coriander from a Thai place that not everybody likes coriander. That's why I say if you don't want to put coriander, you can put parsley with filin or any type of greens. But coriander gives a sweetness. Coriander gives a special taste. So for people who don't like coriander, like at the moment I'm mentioning tabu, I put once in a chicken soup by mistake of instead of parsley, coriander. Since that, I always use coriander in the chicken soup. It gives a sweetness. And my children likes it and they're using it the same. So I have to say, I, I love uh, coriander. Anyway. Um, people, they're hating it. People who don't want to. Yeah, there are those that hate it. But there are those that love it, love it. I put it in everything. Marius, this is Oh, you love it or you hate it. So please, exactly. you can replace it. Everything that you think that is not kosher can be done kosherly. Everything that you think cannot be replaced can be replaced with something else. And that's the whole magic of cooking. It's inspiration, it's your intuition, it's your taste. And you try something, didn't succeed it, you try next time with child that you know that spoiled it. So try it, go for it, it's a pleasure. And just to mention, I'm not a celebrating chef and I'm not even a chef. I just like to cook. And for the advertising purpose, the famous fundi, only my passion for fruit brought me. And as I mentioned it before, about eight years ago, I had the stomach bypass. So my life was around food and just food. After that, I couldn't eat anymore and the quantities went very small. So I like to cook bigger quantity and feed my friends and family. So that's where the passion comes in. And I cooked any type of food in the world up to now. I don't think that is something that you can mention that I didn't do. So that's where the fundi Fundi, fundi soir, I think in Kosa means the illuminator, the, the learned one. So the fundi is coming from there. <laughs> Any case, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, like Marius. Can we, can we have one, one last look at both dishes, just the end result? 
I know yes, you're so not going to plate it. Just have a quick look. And then I think we're going to end it. And hopefully we will have a, another session soon. Okay, here we are. The Chrani, it's only switched off. And you can Beautiful. see the colors. All right, you don't have to eat the chili peppers. What is important, the sauce. And the sauce, you have to tunk it to the good white bread or challah. Amazing. Yummy, yummy. I actually if you want to try inspired to me. Up, you're welcome. And here we are with the chicken. Okay, and you can see the colors. And believe me, it's tasty and flavorful. If you don't serve it immediately, you have to remember to keep stirring it. Otherwise, it's becoming like a chocolate block. And chocolate block came from actually India using it. It's something that is all stick together. A block of chocolate. All right, so with a fork. And I keep it covered because by this will keep the moist and it's gonna be nice and tasty. So you can see the two dishes. And I wish everybody, if you make it, bon appetit and enjoy it until the next time. Be well, keep safe and be healthy. Keep safe everybody, keep safe Marius. We miss you and we hope to see you soon. Thank you to everybody who participated and supported our uh, cooking up in Israel. And uh, we hopefully will be having more of these sessions. Thank you very much. And uh, one thing I must add. Yes. That lot of South African Israeli who returned to South Africa, I mean, from South Africa to Israel, joined into this program and they all watched it because they feel still a connection. So also South African Jews, South African who came to Israel, emigrated, they also joined into this program and thank Fantastic. them. They are friends of mine and thank you for the participating for them. And thank you for supporting. Thank you. We're going to end the session here. Thank you, everybody. And uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Litraot. Litraot. Thank you, Lisa and Marius. That was fantastic. I'm sure everyone will agree. Uh, we'll see you for our next uh, seminars, uh, Mohammed Zawabi, and then the week after that, uh, an exclusive talk with the director of the new film, Golda, which will be available to watch before the meeting. Uh, sign up for our webinars, sign up for our mailing list, like us on Facebook, and have a good, safe day, everybody. Thanks for joining us.